All right, we are uh, starting a new series. We're going to be in this series for probably a good chunk, if not most, of the summer. It's the Gospel of Mark, and we're just calling it Good News. Um, and uh, we are, we're going to talk about this uh, for a while here. But I wanted to let you know, each Monday, my plan with this series is each Monday after we speak on Sunday, on Monday afternoon or so, I'm going to have a little video with some supplemental stuff that will go out in email form and just some extra thoughts, some things I didn't get to in the sermon, some other things to follow up for your own study. And I'm asking that you track with us through this study. Uh, if we take our time, we dwell in a passage, we dwell in the gospel, uh, it really has a profound effect on how we view all things. It can transform our minds and our lives. And so we want to take our time together as a community. Uh, so please take advantage of that. I think it'll really enhance your study of the gospel. And I think it's going to help make Sundays even a little bit more meaningful. Amen? Okay, a few things you need to know about the Gospel of Mark before we jump into it. Um, this is uh, uh, a book that's accredited to John Mark, who was, uh, he hung out around Paul, and he hung out around Peter, and and, uh, and he kind of learned the story of Jesus from them a lot. Um, he was close companions with them. He's suspected to have been writing uh, in, in around A.D. 65 to the church in Rome. And this is right after something called the Neronian Holocaust. Uh, and what was happening at that time is a time of persecution towards the church. And literally Nero was lighting Christians on fire while they were alive at his garden parties. So this is kind of, around this time, this letter of Mark pops up. And he's writing to the Christians that are undergoing this persecution and wrestling through this stuff. He's telling the story of Jesus, but he's actually telling much more than that. He's addressing what the surprising rule of God actually comes to look like. He's addressing the resistance that will come along with the rule of God and what significance of suffering and persecution actually means under the rule of God. And so this is a, this is a, a book that it's really a, an explosion. It goes very quick. It moves. It's the shortest of all the Gospels. It's an explosion of all that the kingdom of God is meant to look like. And when I say the kingdom of God, what I mean is the reign and rule of God. That's considered the kingdom of God. And every kingdom has what? A king, and King Jesus is the king in this story. And so, Mark, it's short, but it's to the point, uh, and it's to the point, but it's not simple. It's a deep, theologically insightful book that if you sit with it, if you walk through it slowly, if you wrestle with it, and what it has to say about the good news and about the kingdom of God and about the King Jesus, the Messiah, it has the ability to transform your life. Amen. So, on that, good news. Mark chapter 1. I'm going to read here in verse 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He's one of the first hipsters in the Bible. And, he, and this was his message. After me comes one who is more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee, or Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as he was coming up out of the water, that he saw the heaven open and being torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels attended to him. And after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. 
Mark begins this gospel with a line that he doesn't repeat again, but really tells us all about what this book is going to be about. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Mark's introducing his gospel and what you can expect to read in his gospel, the whole letter, to be about the good news and about this king. A few thoughts on good news. The good news is something that isn't new to Jesus. What I mean by that? Um, Jesus uh, was bringing, really, a restoration of the good news of what God had already done and was doing. So in the story of the Bible, what God did at the beginning was created all things good. And under his reign, his rule, his loving care, humanity and all creation lived very good, the Bible says. But in creating all things good and in love and in perfect righteousness, he had to give us, humanity, the ability to choose. And so the story goes on to say that in our ability to choose, we chose to, be, to define good on our terms. And that sent us into what is referred to as the fall. A talking snake shows up, things get a little crazy. But along the way of this story, this, this idea of the good news, of this coming reign, this coming Messiah, this coming kingdom starts to crop up all over the place. One passage in Isaiah 40, he says, You who bring the good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout, lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. This idea that one is coming back who will bring the reign of God and this good news of what once was under the rule and reign of God will be experienced again. The good news had to do with God's liberation, his healing, his redeeming power coming and reigning. And the story goes on that the Israel would, would look for that Messiah in their kings. And they would look for it in their national identity and in their politics and in their economy. And they would look for a king like Solomon or like David or many others to be that Messiah who would bring the good news, who would bring the restoration of God's reign and rule. And they imagined it to be something like a political, military, national power that could not be touched. And over and over, the kings failed. And the military failed because they were, like all of us, human and living under the curse. And it would look promising at times. And they would go, oh, maybe this is the Messiah. And then it would fail. And the most righteous among them could not amount up to what they had hoped for. And so the good news is that God's good world that he created that had been corrupted by human sin is now being made right again in the coming of Jesus. He is the long-awaited one. He is the one, the king, that will restore things back to their right order, that will restore, that will liberate, that will heal, that will renew, that will bring back to life that which was once dead, that will bring us back from the fall. But this king is not like other kings. This king is not going to restore and redeem and liberate through military violence or through economic power or politics. No, he's going to restore all things through self-offering love. A love so radical that it would surrender itself even to its enemies rather than to fight them. Healing, liberation, redemption, renewal would come through the life and the way of life of Jesus. Leadership through service. Greatness through humility. Influence through anonymity. Power through surrender. And life through death. This king was unlike any other king. And Mark intends to show us how in the gospel. And so Jesus comes with his first message to the crowds, his first sermon, his first post, have you. And this is what he says. It says, after John was put in prison... Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom, 
The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe this good news. This long-awaited kingdom, this long-awaited king has finally come. So repent and believe, he says. And now we have to deal with this word repent. Is that okay? We're going to talk about this idea of repent. Because if we are to embrace what Jesus is bringing, this, this new kingdom, this good reign of God come back to us, then we have to listen to his instruction about how to receive that kingdom. And he says we have to repent and to believe this good news. Okay, repent. Uh, the Greek word used is metanoia or metanoio, depending on the tense. I don't know Greek. I just know that's how it's written, right? Um, and what it literally means is to, to change your mind, meta, like a metamorphosis, right? To have a transformation of your mind. It's saying that you've been looking at things the wrong way. Now you need to turn and see them as God does in his reality. That's repentance. Am I making sense? Yeah. I was uh, 20 years old when I first learned this concept of repentance. I think prior to that, I had maybe, you know, growing up in church, I'd probably heard the word repentance, and I probably attributed it to more of like feel bad for your sins and ask for forgiveness, which is what many people think of. And yet that's not what repentance is, though it may be a part of repentance. It's not the, the actual definition or agenda of repentance. And for the first time, I learned at 20 years old, studying the Bible in a community much like this, to learn to see things how God sees things. How to see time and money and sex and identity and relationships and talents and material goods and my plans and my ego and my future and the government and the economy and politics and all things as God does. Not that I saw it all that way right off the bat. Or even still do. Right, yeah. right. Hopefully you're aware of that as well, right? Because right. if you think that God sees everything the way you do, you're probably just worshiping a higher version of yourself <laughs> rather than God. So we've got to stay in repentance. Yes. But that I was committing to learning to see it that way. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I was committing, repentance was I am going to commit to learning the rest of my life for all that comes in a faithful direction how to see things God's way. And when I don't, I'm going to repent. And when I fall down, because I thought I was, but I really wasn't, I'm going to repent. And when I knew better, but I still chose the wrong thing anyways, I'm going to repent and choose to keep seeing things God's way. Amen. This is repentance. I would learn to trust myself to Jesus, to his story, to his good news, to his renewal and redemption and liberation that was made available to me and to all of us through his work on the cross and his resurrection. My failure to treat my body and others' bodies with the respect and dignity that God designed it to was not the end of my story. It's not the end of your story. My trust in the fleeting security of, of adventure or beauty or romance or wealth or popularity was not my only option in this life. And it's not yours either. There is one who could be trusted above all. Repentance was not a one-time thing. It's a way of life. This weekend, I had a long week and uh, lots to do. Lot coming back in from... Europe, you think traveling to Europe is tiring? My wife was home with all four boys, handling it beautifully. I got home and I was like, this is exhausting. Um, and and got, getting back into the work of local ministry and actually built a retaining wall, getting ready for some people coming over in our yard. And I go into our Friday night and our kind of Sabbath time and, and I, I go, I'm just exhausted. And I've got my, the threshold of my patience is like at the floor, right? And I'm kind of gritting my teeth, smiling, and praying for dinner, and, you know, that whole thing, right? And then I go, I wake up the next morning, I think, well, maybe a good night's rest. I wake up the next morning, and I feel just like I am walking through mud, you know, like, oh, and my flesh is just screaming. And I go to my son's t-ball game and to my other son's uh, little league game. And uh, it's about 85 degrees, and there's no shade, and we're standing in the sun, and we're leaning against the fence, and we're, we're watching 
seven and eight-year-olds play baseball, which they don't know how to play for two hours. <laughs> and, um, and in the middle, Rachel and I are kind of like trying to coach our kids, and, the, and one of the coaches kind of looks and goes, hey, just please don't talk to your kids right now. <laughs> He's like, well, I'll take care of this, right? You just stay over there and watch. And I'm like, I had a whole bunch of really negative thoughts towards him after that. And, uh, and now I'm like scrutinizing everything that he does, you know what I mean? And I'm like, ah, he's just undoing how I taught my kids how to bat or whatever, you know, like this guy. And, 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 this, 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 and then I get home and it's not getting any better. And then, you know, and, I'm, and Rachel's kind of checking in. She's like, you know, how, how are you doing? Like, think, you doing okay today? And I'm like, I'm fine. Why? You know? And, 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 then the, and then the quiz come over, and we have some time together, and we, we kind of break bread, and we hang out, and I start confessing to Jamie. I'm like, Jamie, this is how my day is going. And, and then they, we have a great time with them, and then they leave, and then, and then Rachel and I are sitting on the couch, and I'm like, this is how my, I feel. I go, Rachel, I feel like the, the least Christian amongst the Christians. Like, I just feel like my heart just gets so, oh, sometimes. Do you know what I'm talking about? And I almost feel like I can't help it. And I just want to like, ah, shut up and go away. And you know, like. And, uh, and she goes, well, you probably are. <laughs> I go, thank you. Thank you. That's a good woman right there. She goes, but, but she goes, but sometimes I am too. And sometimes we all are. And that's why we need grace. And we need repentance and we need time. Are you with me right there? Yes. Repentance isn't a one-time thing. It's something we're always working on. And I had to go in my mind and go, okay, God, how does God view this situation? These volunteers standing out there trying to coach, you know, 15 wily little boys how to play baseball who are kicking dirt and taking off their shoes and running all over. Like, oh, I'm, I'm being shown God's grace. I'm being hosted by strangers outside of the church in this way. I just need to be more grateful and gracious and take a little bit of my ego out of the scenario and stop projecting onto my kids, my, all that stuff, right? Right, right, right? And I need to see things God's way. I need to repent. Repentance is an ongoing work. And through the scriptures, through the practice of the teachings of Jesus, through fellowship, through grace, through the Holy Spirit, through participating in the community of the Christians, we grow to see things God's way. And repentance is both a gift and a decision. Meaning it's a gift. It's something God draws you to, gives you, helps you to find. It's a part of the work of the Holy Spirit. But it's not just that. It's not a magic wand that comes upon you and changes how you see things. It's also a decision. It's something you decide to participate in and take on and wrestle with and relearn. Am I making sense right there? Romans 2 and verse 4, you don't have to turn there. You can just write it down. But It says God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. The fact that you have food and clothing and shelter and many other good things, right? Perhaps even people who love you is a gift in this life that is meant to draw you to see things as God sees them. His kindness. If you're willing to lift your head up from the consumer rat race a little bit, to lift your head away from, you know, your phone and the political religions that tell you you have enemies at every corner, and just to look at the goodness of your life, it's meant to draw you to God's kindness and to repentance. Jesus says, if you want to know what it's like to to live in the kingdom, to live repentant, he says, look at the birds and the flowers. They don't worry about tomorrow. They just entrust that God's provision and care for today is enough. He says, that's how you live in the kingdom. That's how you live under this reign and rule. God is actively, always, continually trying to get your attention to draw you into a new way of seeing things to draw you into repentance. And the world, by the way, the world is actively, always, continually trying to get you to ignore, to ignore the reality of God's kindness. The world says there's not enough. You are a victim. You deserve more. If you just work harder, buy your way to contentment, 
How others think about you is what matters most. You must be the master of your life. Higher achievement will equal higher fulfillment. Life is a race that you must win. The world is trying to get you to ignore the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. All of that is the opposite of God's reality. Repentance, my favorite definition, is a conversion of your imagination. To go, I've been living under this story that if the economy just gets right, or the politics get right, or the right you know, diversity and inclusion is represented in my church, everything will be okay. And Jesus goes, no, no, no. You're living under the wrong story. You're entrusting yourself to the wrong story. Let me teach you a different story. That everything is okay. That God has given you enough. That you are enough. That God's going to provide enough. That it's going to be okay. That you can trust in this way, the way the birds and the flowers do. See things God's way. I love this uh, quote from a book I'm reading right now by Eugene Peterson. He says, a person has to get fed up with the ways of the world before he, before she, acquires an appetite for the world of grace. I love that. That's a great definition of the kingdom, the world of grace. Are you fed up with sex as the world defines it? Are you fed up with identity as the world defines it? Are you fed up with your worth as the world defines it? Are you fed up with power as the world defines it? Are you fed up with agency as the world defines it? Are you fed up with the reality that you are experiencing the same outcome of life as life as everyone else, regardless of their race or their income or their education? The shame, the regret, the anxiety, the depression is the same across the board. The CEO and the cashier are going through the same thing. Are you fed up with that? You have to be in order to see the kingdom and to want that. To see a king that doesn't look like the other kings and to want him to be your king. You have to be fed up. And Jesus would say, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The good news. That you don't have to keep playing church. Your religious life doesn't have to be churchianity where God is a part of your life. You don't have to keep living the way the world does. You don't have to keep regretting your decisions. You don't have to. You can live without the regret of your decisions. You don't have to keep comparing yourself to others. You don't have to keep competing. You don't have to look to more efficiency and technique to find security. You don't have to keep destroying your relationships in the cycles of your sin. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent, see things in God's reality, and believe. In other words, entrust yourself to that story. See it the way God sees it and give yourself over to that story. Some of us have let go of repentance and settled for redundant religious activity. Like our sex life, whether we're married or single, looks just like the world. We look at the same things online. We treat our spouse or others the same way. Some of us, our money management looks just like the world. We're not stewarding. We're not growing to be more generous because we're more enslaved to debt. We're outsourcing our ability to let the kingdom flourish because of the way we chase after the dream, the American dream. Some of us, our reconciliation or our lack thereof in relationships looks just like the world. We're busy in church. We may even have positions of leadership in the church, but but we're not living in the kingdom because we're not repented. We repented some time ago, but we're not living in repentance. We're not aiming our life's direction at repentance, and it's time to turn yourselves in. 
It's time, and I don't say this in judgment, I say this as one who, who shares in the struggle, <laughs> believe me. But it's time to get help from the brothers and sisters in your life. It's time to get help from the people in this community to not keep going at it this way. The outcome, if you do, will be the world's outcome. But it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be in your marriage or in your parenting or in your personal life. It does not have to be. To repent and to believe the good news. Why? Because God doesn't want you to miss out. That's the whole point of the story. And we're going to look at some, some things over the next couple of weeks about how God's just calling those who feel like they're missing out back into participation with God Amen. through all kinds of ways. But God doesn't want you to miss out. And so repentance is necessary. What a, what a sad story to have spent your whole life in religious community, in church, and yet missed out on the kingdom. God doesn't want that for us. Some of us know that it's time to repent and trust the good news. You've been coming to, to church, you've been a guest for some time, and you've watched the good news kind of cropping up and displaying itself amongst the relationships, and you've seen it, and you go, ha, ah, that's a little over there, and I don't know if I'm ready to give up and really go for it, and you've watched it happen, you've been coming, and yet God has led you here. God has 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 allowed your story to unfold the way it has, either for you to intersect in this community, either for you to learn something where you go, man, this is not for me, and move on, or that maybe God has brought you here to learn something about what it means to be in his kingdom. And there's an invitation there open for you. But it's going to mean giving up your ego and your insecurity of what other people will think and surrendering yourself over to that kingdom. It's time. It's time to stop sitting on the fence. Am I going to be all in or am I going to try to hold on to this thing over here in the world and just hope this doesn't go away? It's time. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent. Believe the good news. Do you know what the world needs? The world doesn't need more cultural Christians. It doesn't need more people who can spout out religious arguments. The world needs people who are living in the kingdom. People who understand that the good news has come and they go, I'm all in. I want that reality in my life. You've heard me say it before, but what if worship bands are not going to attract people to Jesus? What if it's not excellent preaching? What if it's not great programs? What if it's not all the right indicators of diversity and inclusion that will ultimately attract people to Jesus? What if it's not the argu arguments over definitions of right and wrong? What if it's not insulting people that will attract them to Jesus? What if it's those who have entrusted themselves to the kingdom and to the king fully who will attract people to Jesus? What if it's those who are living such subversively different lives under a very different story, shaped into a very different type of people, a very different kind of community that leads towards a very different outcome of the good life? What if it's that that attracts people to Jesus? What if it's those people who have repented and believed the good news? The world needs the kingdom of heaven, and it needs people who are of the kingdom of heaven, and you are called to be those kind of people. Let's repent, amen? amen. Let's believe the good news, amen? amen? The king has come, the kingdom is near, and you and I are invited to be a part of it. And that is Mark chapter 1.